Hello friends! This video today will introduce you to the subject of angiotensin receptor blockers, which are also called ARBs. ARBs are the foremost and state-of-the-art blood pressure medications used worldwide. I will also be briefly describe other blood pressure medications and I will discuss the differences between some of the most um, interesting or attractive ARBs. I want you to know ahead of time that I am not a doctor and this is absolutely not medical advice. ARBs are uh, probably controlled substances. You should only take them under the supervision of your doctor and you can easily get them prescribed from your doctor. I highly recommend against ordering them online from India as many people have been doing because you may end up, first of all, you may be doing something illegal and second of all, you may end up hypotensive or you may use the wrong medication unknowingly and so on. The reason why I'm making this video is that during my second podcast with Boston Lloyd, I received a tremendous number of uh, question, comments or questions asking which ARB I had mentioned during the podcast. And I had mentioned an ARB during the podcast sort of offhandedly. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should discuss this uh, in one single video that I can point people to so they can understand more about them. So first of all, I want to tell you guys uh, a little bit about the history of blood pressure medications. So in the 1960s, uh, the first blood pressure medication introduced uh, in the US was calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are almost as effective as beta blockers. Um, I won't, I have another video on beta blockers. I should probably link that here, but, uh, they have more side effects. After them in the 1970s, aldosterone antagonists were introduced. Uh, again, not the best medication in the eighties, ACE inhibitors, that is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors were introduced. And in the 1990s, finally, angiotensin receptor blockers were introduced. If you don't know what these things are yet, don't worry because I'll get into them in a little bit. But I just wanted you to see the progression in the 20th century of the introduction of um, blood pressure medications. And the reason why I say this is because I do encounter people that still take ACE inhibitors, which is not ideal. So angiotensin receptor blockers uh, are as effective as ACE inhibitors at lowering blood pressure, but they have generally less side effects and uh, this is found almost you know gen almost all, all the time now the interesting thing is that arbs have other effects which are helpful that ace inhibitors also don't have and that's really what we're going to get into in this discussion today so i've written some notes for myself just so that i make sure that i don't forget anything so you may see me looking down at my paper every so, every, every so often and that's probably why so first let me tell you about the Ren renin angiotensin system so the renin-angiotensin system is a system that modulates blood pressure in the body. Renin is released by the kidneys when the body notices that the blood vessels are very loose, loosely constricted. Renin then uh, cleaves, so there's something called angiotensinogen produced by the liver. And also produced, by the way, by astrocytes in the central nervous system. But anyway, renin takes cleaves angiotensin type 1 from angiotensinogen, which is a pro-hormone. After it does that, well, let me see if I wanted to mention something else. Yeah, after it does that, the ACE enzyme, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, A-C-E, cleaves angiotensin type 2 from angiotensin type 1. Actually, it does a couple of things, ACE. It does that, and it also inhibits bradykinin. So, the first thing, let, let's look at these two effects. So ACE takes angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1. Okay, that, is, that has an effect on aldosterone. See, angiotensin type 2 increases, well, before I skip around. So the first thing is that angiotensin type 2 has an effect on the constriction of blood vessels. Mm -hmm. But the inhibition, the degradation of bradykinin also has an effect because bradykinin produces arachidonic acid and nitric oxide, or sorry, arachidonic acid metabolites and nitric oxide. So bradykinin also causes vasodilation. So the uh, degradation of, bra of uh, bradykinin also uh, constricts blood vessels, but so does this cleaving of angiotensin type two from angiotensin type one. Now angiotensin type two increases aldosterone synthesis. This is something bodybuilders will be familiar with, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone. 
in this uh, using because of these two uh, effects first it uh, increases salt retention and then it increases fluid retention so that's what angiotensin type 2 does so you can think of it like this your blood vessels get relaxed renin comes out renin pulls out angiotensin 1 from from the pro hormone angiotensinizin angiotensinizin and then uh, ACE comes and takes angiotensin type 2 from angiotensin type 1. And that angiotensin type 2 is very effective at constricting blood vessels, but ACE also degrades bradykinin, which also constricts blood vessels. So, the original drugs in the 1980s, the ACE inhibitors, were targeting ACE to limit the conversion of angiotensin type 1 to angiotensin type 2 and to limit the effect on bradykinin. However, this doesn't go really to the root of the problem which is really the signaling of angiotensin type 2, that final molecule. Angiotensin type 2 signals to two receptors. One is called um, angiotensin 2 receptor 1, which is, by the way, always... Par uh, uh, the acronym is AT1. And it also signals to AT2, which is angiotensin 2 receptor 2. So, the difference is that AT1 is very... So the AT1 signaling is the main concern we have, and the AT2 signaling can actually be beneficial. Now, uh, I'd like to make a, a couple of notes. AT1s are found not only in the smooth muscle of blood vessels, but also in the adrenal gland and at adrenergic nerve synapses. What does that mean? That means when you have adrenaline signaling in your body, and adrenaline is signaling through nervous uh, synapses, there are AT1 receptors there. So blocking AT1, which is the first receptor of the angiotensin type 2, actually inhibits some of the adrenergic signaling in your body, which you'll, 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 you'll think about later when I talk about stress and other kinds of things. Um, yeah, and also the blockade of angiotensin type 1 obviously reduces vasopressin, aldosterone, and increases renin. So renin will increase because it will notice that the blood vessels are expanded, but it won't be able to complete its... Uh, uh, it's a uh, pathway when you have an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. And again, the final thing I wanted to mention is that the SNPs, which means single nucleotide polymorphisms, those are the genetic variants that we share in common or have different between us. The ones that primarily influence uh, ARB effectiveness are at the AT1 receptor gene, which is that first uh, receptor for angiotensin type 2. Now, I do want to mention briefly as a side note, that uh, blood pressure in general is a very polygenic uh, phenotype. Like hi being hypertensive is a polygenic phenotype. So there are, you know, at least 30 SNPs that are significantly affecting, affecting uh, hypertension. So in my cardiovascular uh, genetic analysis report, you'll find that there are tons of different, I mean, there are at many layers of the system. And not only at this system, but also at the sympathetic nervous system, at adrenaline, psychological stuff. So there are many things, but the system has to work through the renin-angiotensin system, uh, which is called RAS, by the way, in the literature. So, now let's talk about different ARBs. Uh, I recently heard uh, a podcast or a bit of a podcast from Fuad Abiyad, who is this bodybuilder that uh, about a year ago, I uh, made a video about saying that he was being... Um, irresponsible in um, he had a he had a video called a blood pressure supplement protocol which included by the way a lot of supplements that don't affect blood pressure either directly or indirectly but that wasn't the main issue the main issue why I made that video is because I feel like hypertension especially for bodybuilders is a very serious condition and there should be no nobody should ever advise people like oh check out the supplement if your blood pressure is only slightly high because it's it's too dangerous of a game to play. Now at the time when I first uh, uh, made this video, which got Fouad very upset by the way, and he you know, did a, little, a lot of things. But anyway, when I first made that video, and it wasn't about Fouad or anything, it was because I was, I used to lift weights. I used to take uh, PEDs like Fouad. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, not like a pro bodybuilder, but I used to take PEDs also. And I was always using a uh, ARB while I was taking PEDs from, from almost the start because I knew that the kidney damage was the biggest concern we had when using PEDs. Now at the time, I didn't know that androgens in general damage kidney function. 
So men experience kidney failure way more than women. These are not on PEDs. And there's tremendous other evidence of this. Not only that, obviously, but protein consumption, size, all of these things also influence uh, the kidney uh, uh, glomerulosclerosis that develops. But blood pressure is not something, you don't want high blood pressure because that will cause direct damage to the kidneys. So at least you control what you can control. And so I was very against this kind of attitude of, you know, try these supplements and then see if it doesn't help, then do this. Because people tend not to be checking their blood pressure enough. So they may try something, notice it's uh, a little bit better, if that even happens, which by the way is doubtful, but it's a, it's a little bit better, then they forget about it. And in reality, their blood pressure is high every day and they, they were just probably, you know, at night time checking it. Now I notice Fouad recommends to people to check their blood pressure twice a week. That's what I originally recommended in my response to him, which is not twice a week, but my recommendation uh, for people that are curious if they're hypertensive is to check their blood pressure three different times during the day differing those times for a week straight, and then writing those numbers down. If the number ever exceeds 120 over 80, you are hypertensive to some degree. Being over 130 over 80 or 90 means that you're incurring damage to your cardiovascular system. This was uh, determined in the last 10 years. It's very well known. I'm not gonna make a citation here, but and even doctors know that. Before they used to think over 140 would uh, of systolic blood pressure would cause damage. So anyway, I was watching a video recently of uh, Fouad and I noticed that he said he takes azelsartan. So we're gonna talk about ARB types now. Azelsartan is the uh, ARB that has been shown to be the most effective at reducing extremely high um, hypertensive uh, markers. So. At the max dose of all the other ARBs, they are slightly less effective than azelsartan at its max dose. So I assume that this is either Fouad has a good doctor who knew what he was doing and Fouad had an extremely high blood pressure that was not able to be controlled by AR, other ARBs or they got lucky. But in either case, azelsartan, that's what it's known for. I'm not going to consider all of the uh, ARBs in this discussion. I'm going to talk about mainly three, in fact, particularly two. And the reason why is I'm selecting the blood pressure medications that have other effects that are, that are interesting. But briefly, I wanted to tell you guys, number one, one thing to consider is the selectivity of an ARB over 81 over 82. So what does that mean? Remember, angiotensin type two is signaling most of its vasoconstrictive signals to the 81 receptor. But there's also an 82 receptor. The AT2 receptor has other effects, which we'll discuss in a bit. So different ARBs are more or less selective over the two. So in the case, for example, the most selective is Valsartan, which is the one I used to take for a very long time. Valsartan, in my opinion, has generally the, le the least side effects of any ARB that you could take. It's a great starting one. Um, now, the, so the most selective is Valsartan at 30,000 more selectivity of AT1 over AT2. Next is Telmisartan, which we'll talk quite a bit about, which is 3,000 more selective of 81, 3,000x, you think of it that way, of 81 over 82. And the least select, or the third most selective is Losartan, which is actually the first ARB ever discovered. And Losartan is 1,000x more selective. A second thing to consider is the half-life. So, Valsartan has a six hour half-life. Losartan has a six to nine hour half-life. Telmisartan has a 24 hour half-life. Now, that's an interesting thing. Uh, also about bioavailability. So, tell me Sartan is the most bioavailable of these three. It's 43% uh, bioavailable. Low Sartan is 33%. And Val Sartan is 23% bioavailable. Does that really matter much? I mean, it, all, it mat all it means is that your kidneys are going to excrete uh, a significant amount of the less bioavailable ones. But this is interesting. gives us an interesting profile for tell me Sartan. So, tell me Sartan has the longest half-life. And it is the most bioavailable, and it is not the most selective. That, that's uh, it's the you know three thousand x. It's fine, but it's not nearly as selective as Valsarta. So, tell me. Well, I, actually, I won't get into this yet. Um, yeah, I should mention that all the ARBs have similar affinities for the AT1 receptor. It's just the AT2 receptor agonism that's the concern. With that said, though. Uh, the low, uh, low sartan has the lowest AT1 affinity. 
and uh, I can't pronounce this one, but Serbi Sartan or something like that has the highest. This is not important. But it's interesting to know that they all have the same effect basically on the AT1 receptor. It's more about how much do they actually block the AT2 receptor as well. Now, before I talk to you guys about the other effects of ARBs, I want to talk about the actual effect of blocking the AT1 receptor. Because there are effects on the body that are profound from just doing that, that go beyond uh, you know, lowering blood pressure or relaxing blood vessels. So, first of all, when someone has hypertension over a long time period, they develop what's called left ventricular hypertrophy, which means their heart is growing in a pathological manner. Now, the interesting thing is, a, both ARBs and ACE inhibitors uh, reduce left ventricular hypertrophy. In fact, they, they make it smaller, independent of their effects on blood pressure. Very interesting concept. ARBs also include, uh, also increase uh, skeletal muscle hearing, healing and decrease fibrosis in the muscle uh, after injury to the muscle. Um, this could be through a variety of mechanisms, which you'll understand in a second. Now, they have incredible effects on the brain. First of all, AT1 signaling. So remember, we have AT1 and AT2 receptors that respond to angiotensin type 2. AT1 signaling is generally appears to be harmful for the brain, whereas AT2 signaling appears to be helpful. I'll get into a bit more detail in a second. This has been shown in mouse studies. Uh, AT1 and AT2 receptors both exist in the brain's mitochondria, particularly in mitochondria associated with dopaminergic neurons. But AT1 activation increases superoxide production, which is a free radical, while AT2 activation provides a defense against the oxidative stress directly. You'll notice sometimes the AT1 and AT2 receptors act in opposing fashions. So for another interesting thing is this, as rodents age, the proportion of AT1 receptors to AT2 receptors in their brains, um, they, well, they, it increases. The AT1 receptors increase as they age, the proportion. So this may be an explanation for cognitive decline in humans as well. Now, the, there's some evidence, I'll probably cite papers here, AT1 receptor uh, signaling is associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. AT2 receptor agonism, which means, you know, because an inter interesting thing that happens, when you block the AT1 receptor, there is more angiotensin type 2 available to attach to the AT2 receptor. So, even though you may be blocking a little bit of the AT2 receptor, you're still having more activity at the AT2 receptor when you block the AT1 receptor. So, AT2 receptor agonism is associated with neuroprotection and neurogenesis after traumatic brain injury. Um, it also attenuates uh, ischemic brain damage. It enhances cerebral blood flow. It enhances axonal neuroplasticity. Axons are what neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters are produced in their own neurons, like dopamine is produced in dopaminergic neurons, or serotonin, which I may talk about later today, is produced in the uh, serotonergic uh, neurons. Um, anyway, th these, these, the neurotransmitter is produced there, but it's sent across the brain in something that looks like sort of like tentacles. These are called axons. Um, so, Axonal neuroplasticity is increased by AT2 signaling in response to increased BDNF production. BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Think of that like a growth hormone for your brain or whatever. You know, it's a gro big growth factor for your, for your brain. And AT2 signaling also has been shown to enhance learning and memory in rats or rodents in general. AT1 antagonists, which is what ARBs are, reduce stress and anxiety. And why could this be happening? Because they're disrupting that adrenergic signaling in the nerve synapses. Remember, adrenaline produces an anxious phenotype, which I may also discuss later today, actually. You know, these videos will be spaced apart, but hopefully you guys will learn quite a bit from them. Um, so also, the ARBs, specifically ARBs, not just AT1 uh, blockers in general, modulate the NF-kappa-B inflammatory gene transcription pathway and the STAT3 signaling. And they inhibit, this is very evidence, there are tons and tons and tons of papers about this showing this. They inhibit microglia activation. Microglia are the innate immune components of the nervous system. Their overactivation or chronic activation is very contributive 
to neurodegenerative disease and cognitive decline. ARBs inhibit microglial activation. This is definite. There's no question about that. And therefore reduce neuroinflammation. Uh, there's also a review that shows that uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs may be protective for uh, the risk of developing Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, and multiple sclerosis, which are all neurodegenerative diseases. And this is probably through the anti-inflammatory pathway, as well as the neurotrophic pathway, because the AT2 part is uh, creating neurotrophic uh, signals in the, in the nervous system, and the AT1 part inhibiting that is reducing inflammation. This is what I believe is happening. But there's more to it than that when we get into the different kinds of ARBs. So one concern I want to mention, um, because this is theorized to occur because the blockade of AT1 increases the signaling at AT2, and AT2 may increase what's called angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the development of new vascular structures in the body, which means new blood vessels to send blood to different places. Generally, angiogenesis sounds like a great thing unless you have cancers. Now, some cancers can grow in oxygen-depleted environments, but many of them need what's called VEGF, V-E-G-F, vascular endothelial growth factor, to increase angiogenesis in the area to increase the, um, the, blood, the oxygen supply to the cancers. So, because of this change in signaling, there is a very minor association of ARBs to cancer uh, development. It's very minor. Now, the interesting thing I want to mention is that tell me sartan is not associated with an increased cancer incidence than the rest of the ARBs. And you, this may not make sense to you yet, but it will in a second, why I'm saying that. So, first thing I want to talk about, we've talked about Valsartan. Valsartan is basically a really clean ARB. If you're concerned about side effects or, you know, you want something very selective, it probably, if, if our theory of why cancers are increasing from ARBs very minorly, if our theory is correct, then Valsartan should produce the, l the least of that effect, but it should also produce the least uh, neurogenesis in the brain and so on. Uh, I used Valsartan for many years. Uh, 160 milligrams is the maximal dose. That's what I was using for a long period of time. I can no longer use that dose because I lost a lot of uh, body weight and also, um, you know, I don't know. I think my, my, my system is functioning a little bit better now after a few years of... Uh, of eating well and so on. So I can't use 160 milligrams. Now, I have recently switched from Valsartan to another medication, which I'll describe briefly, because I wanted uh, other effects. Now, if you were gonna go away from Valsartan, you would only go to three other ARBs, really. One is Azelsartan, which you would use if you have extremely uh, high blood pressure that's not being able to be controlled by the other ones. Otherwise, you would go to Losartan, which is the first ARB ever discovered, or you would go to Telmisartan. Let's start with Losartan. The benefit of Losartan is mainly that it decreases uric acid absorption in the body, therefore increasing the kidney's excretion of uric acid in the urine, therefore acting as a minor uric acid, um, like, a, you know, the drug allopurinol, which is used for people with gout, and also something that I like to take when I'm fasting because fasting increases uric acid, so does metformin, so does ACAR, for example. Uric acid is strongly associated with cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, strongly. Having high uric acid levels is not good at all. So there are two advantages of Losartan. Number one, it decreases uric acid levels in the body. Now, technically, excreting more uric acid could mean that over time, you, if you're prone to kidney stones, you may develop a kidney stone but it's probably still healthier than having the high uric acid levels. But the second interesting thing about Losartan is that it's quite kidney protective. The kidney protective effect does not seem to come from the uh, hypotensive effect. Instead, it seems to be an anti-inflammatory effect that's improving kidney function. So Losartan may be quite attractive to bodybuilders, uh, specifically. Now, um, Oh, this is interesting. I, I forgot to mention, it could also be not just the anti-inflammatory effect, but reducing angiotensin type 2's pro-fibrotic effect, which you would think all the other ARBs do, but this is something that's been theorized about Losartan specifically. Now, I, I should mention that probably all the ARBs would improve kidney function in someone that's hypertensive, but Losartan has been shown to do so particularly. 
Now, tell me Sartan, which is the other one that you would consider, is what the rest of this video will probably be about. Tell me Sartan is a very, very interesting molecule. So tell me Sartan, well, let's talk about history first. It was in 2003, tell me Sartan was, was people noticed that tell me Sartan and pioglitazone, which is a TZD, I'll talk about them in a second, have a similar structure, molecular structure, which made people think that tell me Sartan may have an effect on what's called the PPAR receptors. We'll, we'll talk about that also in a little bit. In 2004, it was first shown that Tamisartan is a partial agonist of PPAR gamma, which looks like PPARY. Now, let me tell you about the, the deal with Tamisartan. First of all, okay, let's talk about these peroxisome proliferator, prol proliferator, this is a mouthful, peroxisome proliferator activated uh, proteins or activated receptors. So PPARs. PPARs fall into three classes. Now what they do essentially is, so the PPARs regulate gene transcription in response to their natural ligands. Ligand is something that binds to a receptor. A natural ligand in the case of PPARs are basically fatty acids. So for example, the medium chain triglyceride um, decanoic acid binds to the PPAR gamma and agonizes it naturally, okay? Um, there are, well, before that, let me talk about the two ways in which PPARs affect genes. So first of all, they do something called transactivation, which means that it's DNA dependent. They bind to PPAR response elements that exist naturally in target genes, thereby uh, changing the gene transcription and they also heterodimerize with, interestingly, retinoic acid receptors, specifically the RXR receptors, retinoid X receptors. Now, the second thing they do is DNA independent, and it's called transrepression. And basically what they do here is, without affecting the DNA, they interfere with other transcription factors that would transcribe certain uh, uh, DNA dependent pathways. So in, this seems to be how PPARs generally reduce inflammation. Now, there are three kinds of PPAR, and it's important to distinguish them. I've made a previous video about the PPR delta slash beta, depends which side of the Atlantic you are. I'll link that here. And in that video, generally, well, okay, before I get to that, so there, there's a PPR alpha, okay? It's found naturally in the liver, the heart, muscle, and vascular walls. It is agonized by the class of medicines called fibrates, which are medicines that are given to people with... Uh, metabolic syndrome or cardiovascular disease. These medications have side effects, by the way. Uh, the PPR delta or beta, as again, as I said, depending on which side of the Atlantic you are, I'm going to call it delta. The PPR delta is found quite ubiquitously in the body. It's very com commonly found everywhere. It's uh, the most known ligand of PPR delta that is synthetic is called cardarine or GW some number. That's the video that I linked earlier. It's about cardarine. Now, I wanna take a brief moment to discuss, actually no, before I do, there's a third one, it's called PPR gamma, looks like a Y, it's Greek letter gamma. It's found mostly in adipose tissue, but also in pancreatic cells and vascular walls. And it is agonized by a class of drugs called thiazolidine, oh, I can't even pronounce this. It's, they're called TZDs. You just Google TZDs, go to Wikipedia TZDs, you'll see the drugs. These drugs are anti-diabetic medications, um, but, but it's also agonized by telmisartan, which is an ARB. Now, I wanna take a brief moment to discuss the PPAR uh, in bodybuilding as well as uh, in longevity. So, I get a lot of comments from people that believe that cardarine is healthful, and they believe that there are isolated mouse studies that show that cardarine increases tumorogenesis in a similar way that, for example, aspartate, uh, as, aspartame, the sweet, sweetener, has increased tumorogenesis in mice. And as everyone knows, lab mice are particularly prone to tumorogenesis, cancer development. This is not true. It's not a mistake. Cardarine does increase tumorogenesis. In fact, I'm going to link a paper here, which I highly recommend you read if you're taking cardarine or interested in taking it. 
The PPR delta pathway does decrease uh, tumor genesis or cancer development, cancer cell prol proliferation in prostate cancers. But almost every other cancer researched is uh, the, the development of the progression of the cancer is increased by PPR delta agonism. And part of the reason why is PPR delta is very much involved in angiogenesis, that the development of new vascular structures. But it's also involved in many other things. Check out that paper to understand the thinking behind why PPR delta is very much involved in cancer development. Now, there is a good side of PPR delta. It likely decreases inflammation specifically in the vascular system, which means it could reduce the development of plaque buildup in the vascular system. That's absolutely true. It may also be helpful for the liver in terms of getting fat out of the liver, so anti-diabetic in a way, or anti-metabolic syndrome, but it is almost certainly what you would call pro-cancer. So th there's no question about that. Trust me, if that was not the case, I have researched this very extensively. I would be taking cardarine every day. I really enjoy cardarine. It increases my, um, my um, exercise uh, endurance tremendously quickly. It's very, very effective. And it may be used by people in the short term in that sense. But, you know, I, even if I was very young, I would still not take it in the long term because of this extreme danger. Now, some people also mentioned to me, uh, I saw a comment the other day, metformin combined with cardarine will inhibit some of the side effects of cardarine. That is not the way to approach this. Metformin does, in, you know, has anti-cancer elements to it, but you're not combating the increase in angiogenesis directly you're muddling the system out. You may end up with a side effect that, you know, I, I wouldn't do it is what I'm trying to say. Now, PPR alpha is associated a little bit with some cancers, but not nearly as much as PPR delta. Then PPR gamma, well, we'll talk about PPR gamma now. So first of all, uh, I want to talk about these TZDs that I can't pronounce. Basically, they're an anti-diabetic drug that worked by agonizing the PPR gamma receptor. Now, they were originally pulled from the market because they had quite severe, very rare, but very severe liver effects on the liver. So a couple of people's liver, livers failed. Now, they brought out two more TZDs that, that have been approved and they are they're in circulation in the US, that aren't, but still, the recommendation is to check liver values while you take them. Now, uh, there's two theories for how TZDs affect um, uh, diabetic symptoms. The first one is called the fatty acid seal hypothesis. And basically what this means is that TZDs help fat go to where they need to go. So they go to adipocytes, which means uh, fat cells, instead of staying in the bloodstream or being stored in muscle, which is something that bodybuilders would benefit from a lot because I, lo I think a lot of them have a lot of fat in their muscle, at least the, the bigger bodybuilders now. Um, and then the reason why I think that, by the way, if you just look at the difference in shape of bodybuilders over time, um, they get they had now much more muscle in areas you that also naturally store more fat so in the what they call the glutes or the legs those areas tend to store more fat and also their waistline expands so it's likely a lot of intramuscular fat anyway that's not that important the point is there's also indirect effects other than this fatty acid seal hypothesis the first one is that well these are the two names of the tzds available right now i will try to name them but honestly i'll probably butcher the names rossi Man, whoever wrote these names, it's not to be pronounced. One is pioglitazone. The other is rosiglitazone. I mean, what is this? It's ridiculous. They all end with own, zone specifically. So, the interesting thing is that these two drugs regulate over 100 genes, but they don't regulate the exact same genes. So they're showing differential effects on their agonism of the PPR gamma receptor. Now, uh, PPR gamma regulates TNF alpha, which is tumor necro necrosis factor alpha, and this may have some effect on diabetic uh, symptoms. But TZDs also raise adiponectin synthesis, and adiponectin is insulin sensitizing as well as anti uh, atherogenic, which means it reduces uh, plaque buildup in the arteries. Um, TZDs also down, this is very interesting. So TZDs through the PPR gamma receptor downregulate 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 1 which is responsible for the conversion of cortisone into cortisol. So it uh, locally reduces cortisol synthesis in the fat. Um, so unlike TZDs, ARBs are not associated with weight gain. 
TZDs are associated with weight gain, which is one of the reasons many people don't take them or don't want to take them that are diabetics. But ARBs are not, and this is probably because telmisartan, which is the most powerful agonist of the PPR gamma receptors among the ARBs, is only a partial agonist, and it is selective on the tissue. So it's not a full agonism of the PPR gamma. It's not like what you would get, I mean, if that is full agonism from the TZDs. With that said, Telmisartan is not the only ARB that agonizes or let's say binds to the PPR gamma receptors. So, Telmisartan is the most powerful, but second of all is Irbisartan. Third of all is Losartan. Losartan does agonize the PPR gamma receptor, but very mildly. So that's another benefit to Losartan actually. Valsartan, by the way, binds to the PPR gamma receptor, but does not a activate it. And by the way, the way you find this out, just for you guys to know that are interested in science, there are experiments called lig ligand binding assays. They check how much a molecule will bind to a receptor. But this doesn't actually tell them whether the molecule agonizes the receptor or antagonizes it or mo modulates it allosterically. What they do instead then is have to check out a response element to the receptor's agonism and see if that's upregulated. And when that's upregulated, you know it's agonizing it. And so this is what's called efficiency also. So there's, there's the amount that the agonist will bind to the receptor, which is the affinity, but then there's the amount that that binding will cause a, a consequent change in biology, which is called the efficiency, just so you guys, for you guys to know. So anyway, in terms of other PPARs, now this is very interesting also. A couple of days ago, someone commented on one of my videos that was not even about PPARs, saying, uh, you know, Cardarine only agonizes the uh, PPR delta, uh, receptor, but Telmisartan, which I don't know how he knows about it, but Telmisartan agonizes all three PPR receptors. Now this may be true, but it's not really true. The reason why is, I, what I'm trying to say is, it's not a full agonist even of the gamma receptor, which is what it agonizes the most. And originally it was thought not to agonize the alpha or delta receptors at all. In fact, the original studies uh, biochemical assays showed that, but later it was shown that telmisartan in rodents activates PPR ta target uh, PPR alpha target genes in the I think liver, but not yeah liver, but not muscle, and only at very high concentrations. So it's a selective agonist of the PPR alpha at very high concentrations, and it also appears to cause some PPR delta expression in rodents but again, way more mild than the PPR gamma, which is why this is not such a scary thing and probably why it's not associated with greater cancer incidence, which it would be probably if it was a strong agonist of the PPR delta. So, on, my, on our last page of notes, oh no, not, not really. Anyway, uh, so, a couple more things I want to talk about. Um, Telmisartan is more lipophilic. I should have also talked about lipophilicity of the ARBs, but Telmisartan is the most lipophilic, which means it is the most soluble in fat. Therefore, it has the most potential to uh, cross the blood-brain barrier uh, or get into the nervous system in general, which is probably a good thing because we want that PPR gamma signaling, uh, or at least we want the 82-81 signaling to occur in the nervous system. But Still, I don't know how well it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it's just the best of the options. Um, also, an interesting thing, Telmisartan down-regulates 81 mRNA expression, but not, because think about it this way, Telmisartan is blocking 81. Eight, when you block 81, the mRNA should increase, because they want your body wants to produce more 81 so that it can sense the signal. But Telmisartan actually does the opposite, it causes less expression of 81. Which, indic which must be through a non-angiotensin um, receptor uh, pathway. It must be through the PPR gamma pathway. Obviously, it improves insulin resistance because of the PPR gamma. So now you're getting a vasodilation, improved insulin resistance, reduced in uh, inflammation in the body. Uh, also, interestingly, so telmisartan has been shown to inhibit hepatocellular carcinoma growth in the liver by increasing AMP kinase signaling and decreasing mTOR signaling. Now this is very significant because PPR delta agonists are specifically shown to increase hepatocellular carcinoma, the most form, um, common form of uh, liver cancer uh, growth. So this does the opposite. Um, it also 
now this is through the PPR delta pathway. It increases prostate cell cancer, uh, sorry, prostate cancer cell apoptosis, which is something, as I said earlier, it's known about the PPR delta, but that's the only thing that PPR delta seems to do that's good. And we haven't seen any pro-cancer effects of telmisartan yet. It also reduces ovarian cancer cell proliferation via the PPR gamma receptor. Um, in terms of cardiac disease, it's been shown to improve cardiac fibrosis in diabetics, which means the deposition of collagen in the cardiac uh, area, via PPR delta. See, I told you before, PPR delta has beneficial effects in, in the body, but except for the cancer element. It improves cardiac remodeling by inhibiting uh, activity of leptin and activating PPR gamma. Cardiac remodeling means uh, that's something you want. When, you're, when you have, for example, hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy or something like that, you want your, your cardiac system to reorganize itself. And that's also something you generally want. You know, plaques can build up and can be taken away in the body. It's only like past the age of 50 or so that the plaques just stay. So if you change your lifestyle a lot, things can undo themselves. And part of that is through cardiac remodeling. Uh, and again, cardiac hypertrophy is reduced via the PPAR y, uh, PPR gamma in the case of telmisartan. So those are my notes. Basically, why I made this video is I wanted to give you guys an introduction to ARBs. I wanted you guys, you guys to know why I prefer ARBs to ACE inhibitors. Of course, I prefer them to chal the calcium uh, channel blockers. Beta blockers only really work for hypertension if your hypertension is, I mean, obviously they'll always reduce uh, hy hypertension a little bit, but they, they only really work if your hypertension is, is what's called white, uh, white coat syndrome, which is when you get nervous, you you get hypertensive. Because if that's the case, then your sympathetic nervous tone turns on, adrenaline signaling increases, and when the adrenaline signaling is increased, your beta blocker blocks that ad adrenaline signaling at the beta receptors, and so your hypertension does not, uh, you know, the hypertension doesn't occur as much. But uh, other than that, the choices are basically between ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Now, ACE inhibitors have more side effects, but they also don't have these potential uh, wonderful effects of controlling the signaling of the AT1 and AT2. Remember, the ACE inhibitors just inhibit the conversion of angiotensin 2. So since you're inhibiting the conversion of angiotensin 2, there's less signaling at AT1 and AT2. Now, as I said before, AT2 promotes angiogenesis in a, a little bit, but in the brain, it promotes neurotrophic factors, all these other kind of great things. So I do want that signaling a little bit. You know, I don't want that much signaling like you would get from cardarine, but I'd like a little bit if there's angiotensin type 2 available to more uh, efficiently agonize the type uh, AT2 receptors, that's great. But also, more importantly, we have these benefits of losartan on uric acid and telmisartan on basically telmisartan, we can think of it as an anti-diabetic drug, insulin sensitizing drug, uh, make sure the fat goes where it should go, uh, much less risk of its PPR agonism because most of the PPRs that are targeted by it are in fat tissue. So generally I would say that telmisartan is an attractive drug. In fact, if I was borderline hypertensive, which is what I am now, actually usually I'm, you know, 120 over 80, but I just reduce it to 110 over, usually it stays at 80, maybe 75, with using this drug because I believe that the signaling is helpful for me. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this reduces stress, it does a lot of things because it, in, it, it impedes that uh, adrenergic system as well. So anyway, I hope you guys found this video helpful. Uh, this is basically a video I would have hoped to have uh, been able to watch when I first got into blood pressure medications. For those that are concerned that these medications will reduce their, um, uh, you know, ability to their strength in the gym or their ability to grow muscle, they will reduce. So look, vasoconstriction is part of your sympathetic nervous drive. The reason you take a pre-workout is because you want sympathetic nervous drive. You want your vascular system to be tightened. You want everything to be signaling quickly. In fact, you, that, I mean, we'll talk about this in another video, but that's the reason clenbuterol, for example, makes people stronger. It agonizes the, uh, the uh, beta adrenergic receptors, and that actually makes people directly stronger. And that's one of the ways, for example, steroids make people stronger, through adrenaline, which eventually constricts blood vessels. So you're breaking that system a little bit. You will be a little bit weaker. If you are a top 10 athlete in the world, you'll be a little bit weaker, 
but you will probably live quite a bit longer because your kidneys will not be as damaged. With that said, if you're not a top 10 athlete, then you really don't have an excuse not to take this if you are hypertensive. And the reason why is because even if you're, I mean, your, your lifts are not gonna go down that much. I was uh, bicep curling 90 pound dumbbells, e hammer curling easily. I was doing partials with, uh, I don't know, one, 150s or I can't remember the numbers, but bicep curls with my medication, with my blood pressure in range, with a beta blocker also. So I'm sure that you can do it. Uh, well, I, you know, I, anyway, I'm not gonna get into my numbers, but the point is, I'm sure you can do it. You're gonna see a slight reduction, very slight. But in turn, you have the peace of mind knowing that your blood pressures are not, your blood, your blood vessels are not popping everywhere. They're not experiencing damage in the structure, which is causing then your immune system to come and try to repair it. And you know, that's the cardiovascular disease. So I hope this was helpful and I'll see you guys next time.